Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Denise Mananis. I'm the Assistant Vice President for External Affairs for St. John's Riverside Hospital, and I would like to welcome you today to St. John's Riverside Hospital's webinar series. Today's presentation is Let's Talk Men's Health. So uh, before we begin and before I introduce our speaker, I would very much like to thank my team who put all of this together for us. Jason Latore is our media production manager and producer of this event. Nancy Nabi, our community liaison, and Candace Cousin Hop Cousins Hopkins, our associate director of external affairs, for all that uh, they do to make this a successful series. Uh, today, uh, before also, I'd like to introduce our community partners. Uh, Sally Pinto, who is from the Yonkers Neighborhood Naturally Occurring Retirement Community that is under the umbrella of Yonkers Office for the Aging and the Westchester Jewish Community Center Services, and Z Baird, who is from the Yonkers Public Library, which has three locations, the Riverfront, the Will Library, and the Crestwood Library. Um, so now to begin our program, I'd like to introduce our speaker. Dr. Matthew Ficari is a urologist with Advanced Urology Centers of New York. He completed his, his Doctor of Osteopathic Medicine degree at New York College of Osteopathic Medicine and a urological surgical residency at Cook County Health and Hospital System in Chicago, Illinois. In 2020, he won the LUGPA Resident Clinical Innovation Award and has published extensively in the urologic literature. He is a member of the AUA, Sexual Medicine Society of North America, the Society of Urologic Prosthetic Surgeons, uh, and he specializes in urinary dysfunction, benign prostatic hyperplasia, kidney stones, and sexual dysfunction. So Dr. Fakari, welcome aboard. Thank you for giving us your very valuable time today. And I'm gonna start, um, if you wanna start by saying something, and then I'm gonna jump right into our questions. Absolutely. Denise, I want to sincerely thank you, Jason, Candice, Nancy, the rest of the team uh, at our St. John's family for uh, helping us putting this together and spreading the love for men's health and answering some of the questions that uh, that some of our audience may have. Uh, I also wanted to sincerely thank Sally and Zbart for getting uh, getting on this call and we sincerely appreciate their time too. Uh, our goal is to strike this as a community event and ensure that uh, the knowledge is spread throughout the community in, um, in a way that everybody understands where we can take a complicated situation such as men's health and break it down into simple terms. So I want to thank the team and uh, the St. John's family for, uh, for allowing me to uh, discuss some of the issues with men's health in today's world. Yes, and I actually thank you. And I, I wanted to point out too that um, men's health is an interesting subject these days because um, for all the women I know, they're the ones who are taking care of their men. So this is something that both men right. and women should be listening to uh, and, and and understand. And, uh, you know, there's been a lot of press. We're going to start with what most people think about when they think about men's health, and that's prostate. Right. Um, so first I wanted to, and then we'll get into some other things that are somehow a little less talked about and a little less known. Um, tell me about the risk factors for prostate cancer. So first of all, I just want to reiterate and voice uh, what you just mentioned because it's a team effort. And what I mean by that is men's health doesn't exist without women's health. So it's important that um, both men and women are involved in the care of, uh, of their spouses and their loved ones. So when it comes into prostate cancer, there's a ton of research obviously out there, but what we like to do uh, is take a complicated issue such as prostate cancer and prostate cancer screening and break it down into simple terms. Now, when should a man start thinking about prostate cancer screening? What we talk about typically in our offices is right around the age of 50 years old. Now, every patient's a little different. So we try to cater to the genetics of the, uh, of the patient that we're seeing, such as if a man is a little bit younger than 50 years old, but he presents with a strong family history of prostate cancer, that's key, okay? Because we do know that there's a strong genetic component for prostate cancer. So, so the genetic component for prostate cancer, does that run through your father or through your mother? Both, there, believe it or not, yes, it, it runs through both. So that's why we asked, are there patient are there does the patient have an uncle or a cousin or a grandfather with prostate cancer and it's irrelevant in my eyes whether it's the mom's side or the dad's side um, both 
we're made up of both our mom and our dad. So I think it's important to to dive into both uh, family histories on the mom and the dad side. And if a patient does have a history of family uh, prostate cancer in the family, those are the patients you want to watch out for. OK, there's a ton of research being devoted into understanding the genetic uh, makeup of what makes a patient have prostate cancer. And we're doing a lot of these tricky little uh, um, studies where we're taking genetic screening, profiling, and understanding what are the components that make up uh, a patient's prostate cancer uh, diagnosis. So if someone has a family connection uh, that had had prostate cancer, right. what age would you say is important for people to start getting checked? Great question. So a patient who comes in without any family history of prostate cancer, we say around the age of 50 years old. Now, I'm going to give a quick one liner. There's been a lot of controversy regarding prostate cancer screening. And uh, not long ago, the United States Preventative Task Force put in a grade D recommendation for prostate cancer screening. And the issue was that a lot of physicians who were not urologists were concerned that the treatment had more risks than the cancer itself. However, what we started to see with those, were those patients who weren't getting screened for prostate cancer ended up showing up into our offices with advanced disease. Now, prostate cancer is a slow growing disease, but we can't take advantage of that. So what that means is those patients who showed up with advanced cancer could have been prevented. OK, okay. and that's what we have to understand that not any, not most, um, excuse me, most of our colleagues may not offer it uh, outside of the world of urology, but we strongly disagree with that because it's important that every man checks on this. We'd rather have preventative medicine, okay, than have to deal with an advanced prostate cancer. So for a patient without family history of prostate cancer, right around the age of 50 years old, African-American men are at an increased risk of developing prostate cancer. We also keep that in mind, all right? For a man who comes in who's 48 years old with an elevated PSA, and the number we talk about typically is between zero and and four. Okay. When we're at that four range or above, we tend to, to be a little more aggressive, especially in the African American male, trying to understand what the risk of prostate cancer is. For a guy with family history of prostate cancer, we start thinking about five years earlier or so. Okay. So can you talk to me about the screening? Uh, Absolutely. For, Great question. Prostate and what the components are. Yes. So typically how, how, how this scenario works out is a patient goes for their physical annual screening with their primary care physician. And if they're right, right around the age of 50 years old, they'll get a simple blood test, which is the PSA screening, the prostate specific antigen, which is made by the prostate itself. And if that number is above four, typically the uh, primary care physician or whoever it may be may refer us for, refer the patient over to our offices. And at that point, we do a little more testing. Uh, one of the things that has been sort of cutting edge and we're utilizing more and more is the use of MRIs of the prostate. OK, and that helps us diagnose prostate cancer in a way that wasn't diagnosed 10 years ago or 15 years ago with a simple um, uh, MRI. We're able to pinpoint sort of like a sniper would. OK, pinpoint the targeted lesion and we're able to dictate whether or not this patient needs more aggressive treatment or diagnostic uh, uh, testing. OK, um, so there's I have two questions. So other than the PSA, when you, when a patient comes in, there's an exam as well. Is that correct? That's Which exactly you, right. So, so they we come do a to digital your office and then yeah. what happens? So uh, this is when the patient and I become very, very close. <laughs> uh, we perform a digital rectal exam, which is basically a finger in the bottom, and um, uh, I use as much lubricant as I possibly can to make sure the patient's okay. But what we do is we palpate the prostate in order to feel whether or not there are nodules or asymmetry or even firmness in the prostate. Those are all red flags in our eyes, okay? So what we have to make sure is we do a digital rectal exam along with the PSA screening, and that kind of gives us a more whole story of what's going on with the patient. Okay, so are there... Can you talk? Well, first of all, we talked about the genetic factors um, of being a high risk. Are there other risk factors aside from the genetics? So it's interesting. Uh, we have patients who may come in with a PSA of 
higher than four, for instance, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's prostate cancer. There are a few reasons why the PSA may be elevated. Number one, a patient may have just an enlarged prostate. More prostate means more production of PSA, and that number may be elevated and falsely elevated in the eyes of prostate cancer screening. A patient may have a urinary tract infection. A patient may also have difficulty urinating, and that causes an infl inflammatory prostate in, uh, inflammatory process within the prostate itself, which will elevate the PSA. So just because a guy has a PSA of five or six doesn't necessarily mean that we're dealing with prostate cancer. And I try to reiterate to that, that to my patients that don't lose sleep over this just yet. Okay, we still have some testing to do. But as far as uh, risk factors, African-American male race and genetics uh, testing uh, uh, risk factors are the big ones. Okay. So, uh, you know, I have a family history. My, my father uh, had prostate cancer. And so I'm very interested now, what are the various types of different treatments that exist? Because there were a lot of side effects at one time. Exactly right. The treatment. So can you kind of walk everyone through, you know, what, what is available to patients now so they get that right. diagnosis and what's the, what's the plan? Whenever a patient is diagnosed with prostate cancer, um, I literally draw it out on the screen and there's typically three categories that we break down prostate cancer into according to the AUA and uh, National Cancer uh, Guidelines. Uh, so what we do is we break down prostate cancer into low, intermediate or high risk. OK, there's also now a very low risk category, which is if I had prostate cancer, that's the one that I would want. OK, and typically in that situation, when we deal with patients with very low risk or low risk prostate cancer diagnoses, what we talk about is something called active surveillance, which means we're not going to ignore this, but we're going to watch it very closely. OK, and that doesn't require any therapeutic treatment other than watching the prostate cancer and the PSA levels very closely. When we're dealing with intermediate prostate cancer or high-risk prostate cancer, we typically tell our patients that something should be done. Now, the different modalities we have, we're getting much better at utilizing radiation therapy so that the only effect we have is at the prostate and the prostate bed. There are risk factors and side effects associated with radiation uh, pros uh, treatment for prostate cancer. Uh, so that's one way. We use radiation treatment. OK, there are different modalities of radiation treatment as well. OK, and uh, we use something called androgen deprivation therapy. So the way I break down prostate cancer is this, the following, and I'll literally draw this out for a patient. Imagine prostate cancer was a fire in your body. How do fires grow? They grow with gasoline. What is the gasoline for prostate cancer in your body? It's the male hormone testosterone. So the androgen deprivation hormone therapy allows us to control the production of testosterone. Once testosterone production is shut down, we can control the advancement and uh, progression of the prostate cancer. Now, that to the side, for both intermediate and high-risk prostate cancer, we also talk about um, removal of the prostate, okay, or radical prostatectomy. Now, we're diving into a world of robotic surgery um, and Robotic surgery is one of the pioneering uh, instruments that we've used for prostate cancer treatment where the prostate gland is completely removed, okay? But again, there are side effects and risks that we talk about with prostate cancer uh, treatment, both of which, uh, both radiation and prostate cancer treatment along with sur for surgery, we talk about erectile dysfunction, we talk about urinary incontinence, we talk about uh, and ejaculation, which basically means when a man ejaculates, they may not see the fluid come out. And those are just some of the simple side effects, but they're overall, they tremendously affect quality of life. So we spend a lot of time talking about quality of life issues. Yes, we can take care of oncological control, but what are the, what's the aftermath? You know, and a lot of these patients don't understand what the aftermath is until the problem occurs. Yes, I took care of my prostate cancer, but doc, I can't make love to my wife. And it's becoming a serious problem for us. So over the past couple of decades, have you have you seen improvements in the the technologies that allow for better outcomes on those Absolutely. extreme <clears throat> responses? Because I do know that that was very typical 20 years ago when right. prostatectomies were performed. Right. But but is is it as bad now? I mean, is there depending on the kind of surgery, is it more precise? You know, are there different techniques now? Is that something that's so 
Great question. So there is absolutely the simple answer is yes, there are tremendous improvements and advancements of both the radiation treatment and the surgical uh, surgical modalities. Using a robot allows us to sort of really examine deep within the pelvis, which we weren't capable of doing when we were doing prostate surgery open. Now, when we compare open surgery versus robotic surgery, there is a tremendous difference at the 15 year follow up. OK, but patients are going home faster. There's less blood loss. Loss, and those matter to both the hospital systems, of course, and to the patients and their loved ones. Um, so there is have there has been a tremendous advancement in surgical expertise, understanding the nerve structures that help control erectile dysfunction or urinary incontinence. OK, so so there's definitely more hope than there used to be. Absolutely. About, OK. Um, so let's switch topics just a little bit and let's talk about something that most people don't like to talk about, and that is sexual dysfunction. So can you give us a little bit of an overview of erectile dysfunction? Absolutely. And, yeah. So I think this is a great segue. One of the things we just talked about was erectile dysfunction as a result of prostate cancer treatment, whether it's radiation or, uh, or surgical removal of the prostate. So it's somewhat of a taboo topic, obviously. And a lot of patients don't like talking about it, especially out in the open. And part of the reason why I thought this webinar is so important was to get the information out to the community that there's nothing to be ashamed of or embarrassed about because patients are shocked when I tell them the statistics of erectile dysfunction in, in the world today, especially in the United States. 40% uh, of men around the age of 40 have prostate cancer. 50% of men around the age of 50 have, uh, excuse me, erectile dysfunction. And 60% of the men around 60 also have erectile dysfunction. This is such a common theme, but unfortunately patients don't want to bring it up to their primary care physicians because they think it's not worthwhile or they're embarrassed. And a lot of the times it's the spouses and their significant others who will drag them into our office and say, doc, he was fine, but now it's not working anymore and it's affecting our marriage and it's all causing a lot of stress. So, so you talked about erectile dysfunction and sexual dysfunction being a side effect of potentially prostate cancer treatment, right. surgery, and whatever. But what are the other causes? Um, Great since question. It seems to be so common. Not all of those men have prostate Have cancer. prostate cancer. Exactly right. Great point, Denise. So as a man gets older, I hate, uh, I hate to say it out loud, but it just is what it is. All right. Um, as men get older, the vascular mechanics of getting blood to the penis just doesn't work as well as it used to. And there's two parts to an erection. I tell my patients, the first thing that comes out of my mouth is, uh, if the big head and the little head aren't on the same page, there's nothing we can do for you. So there's a tremendous mental component um, to erectile function, okay? And uh, we, we tell our patients what's consistent in the world is the following. There's always going to be noise around us. There's always going to be stress and anxiety, and we have to get that out of the way when we talk about erectile function. So with that to the side, the mental component, which is a huge deal, uh, as a man gets older, the mechanics of the way that the penis work just don't work as well as they used to. Then there's two parts to an erection. The first one is where obtaining the erection, actually getting the erection, which is where our brain goes into this extremely complex uh, process of sending hormones and neurotransmitters that allow blood flow to get to the penis. But the second part and the harder part, no pun intended, is maintaining the erection. OK, and that's the most difficult part. And the reason why most men are unable to maintain the erection is because of something called venous insufficiency. And it's very similar to the concept of when both men and women have varicose veins in their legs. OK, those varicose veins are a result of the venules OK, there's a dysfunction in the venules and that concept is the same thing that goes on inside the penis. So what happens is blood gets to the penis, but it begins to escape very quickly. And that's a trouble with maintaining an erection. All right. So as we grow older, mechanics don't work well. There could be a testosterone deficiency, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Low libido. OK, nerve injury, patients with spinal cord trauma or motor vehicle accidents, they may show up and say, I had this bad accident, doc. I had spine surgery and things just aren't working the, as well as they used to down low. OK, so and, and do medications uh, or potential things that people take, blood pressure meds, cholesterol meds, any of that have an effect on it? 
There are several medications that we tend to watch out for when it comes to erectile dysfunction, and both and those are within the the cardiac ward, within cardiology. Patients who have myocardial infarction, strokes, uh, high blood pressure, those are the medications we tend to watch out for because they may cause a difficulty in obtaining an erection. But there are medications that we can provide as a uh, a medical community that will help. Uh, patients obtain the erection and maintain the erection that they like, but they don't always work. And that's where we move down our algorithm. Okay. So what treatments then are available for someone who is experiencing erectile dysfunction? So within the world of erectile dysfunction, uh, we talk about the mental component, and this is probably the most intimate conversation a patient can have with their physician, okay, when it comes to something so uh, so intimate. Uh, what we talk about are medications that can be taken by mouth, and a lot of patients know these medications as Cialis or Viagra, and typically patients will be like, yeah, doc, you know, I tried it once, my friend gave it to me, it worked well, but, I, you know, it wasn't like when I was 18, and I tell them, it's very difficult to become uh, like when you were 18, so we have to manage your expectations. So typically our first thing we talk about is medications by mouth. There are medications that you can take every day, and there's medications you take typically two hours before sex. What most patients don't understand is the medications that we provide that have to be taken two hours before sex have to be taken on an empty stomach. I can't reiterate that enough because food in the stomach will cause uh, absorption issues of the medication through the bloodstream. So always no alcohol and uh, we don't take the medication with food. So if you're going out on a wonderful dinner with your significant other, I typically tell my patients, this is this, this is the move. You get your menu, you sit down, that's when you take your medication. You shouldn't be taking it with food. You wanna give yourself about an hour to two hour window so that when you get home, you're in that car, you're ready to boogie. <laughs> that's, that's great. And what about surgery? So. Before we jump to surgery, we offer patients um, something called a penile injection. Now, the idea of a man injecting his penis is obviously traumatic, but um, most it's a lot. It sounds a lot worse than it actually is. And the needle is very, very small. It's a very thin needle, and we don't typically offer this to everybody because there are risks of intracavernosal injections or ICI, and that's Peyronie's disease, developing plaques within the penis, which cause literally curvature in the penis, and that makes things much harder in order for, uh, in order for the patient to, to penetrate. Um, after injection therapy, if we know that there's a failure or patients are just not comfortable giving themselves the injection, we talk about inflatable penile implant procedure. Um, and that's a surgery that we offer at St. John's Hospital. Um, that's simply where we do the surgeries, where a small incision is made, not on the penis, not on the scrotum, okay? We do an infrapubic approach and the whole surgery takes about 45 minutes. Patients go home the same day and it involves a three-piece penile implantation where the patient is literally in control of their erections and they no longer have to rely on medications or injections. And it's the most reliable and reproducible erection that a man can achieve once they're determined to be or have erectile dysfunction. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so now uh, we've talked about some of the tough things. Let's uh, not that this is any less tough, but let's shift gears a little bit. Um, let's talk about infertility and and you know normally women who carry the baby uh, and or have trouble getting pregnant, they all you know historically it's it's they are the ones who start with the investigation. But talk to us about what is going on with men and infertility? So men and infertility, um, what I tell every one of my patients who are struggling to have a baby and conceive is that this is a journey. Every patient's journey is different. Some patients, it'll take them four or six months, sometimes more than a year or two years, but they have to keep in mind that this should be fun, it should be sexy, and as stressful as, as this may be, and put a strain on the relationship, a husband and wife uh, or their significant other, whoever it may be, they have to be on the same page that we are together. We are a team and we're going to take on this journey and and uh, God has a plan for us is what I tell each one of my patients. So within the world of infertility for men, what we talk about is typically the guidelines tell us uh, wait a year. OK, some men are more aggressive and want to understand, well, doc, it's been six months. My wife and I are starting to point fingers at each other. It could be you, it could be me. And that becomes a very dangerous game to play because it adds a tremendous amount of stress on a relationship. And we don't want that. Uh, so uh, what we tell our patients is, 
other than it being a journey, we like to get a sperm analysis. We get a semen analysis in order for us to determine what the levels of sperm concentration are within the ejaculate, okay? And that's sort of our step one, okay? Um, once we get our results back a couple weeks later, we're able to review the results with the patient and kind of point out where things are could be a little bit better. Um, and hopefully, as long as there's one soldier in there, we know that a pregnancy and conceiving is possible, okay? Now, there are medications that will help increase sperm parameters, meaning if the concentration is a little low, if the motility, these little guys, they got to swim up that canal <clears throat> in order to make it home so that we can make a, a, a pregnancy possible. There are medications that can help increase those parameters so that the chances are better. OK, um, we typically talk to our patients about what kind of workup their spouse has had. Have they seen uh, their OB or their gynecologist and make sure that everything is working well, whether it's a transvaginal ultrasound or their hormones in check for both the man and the, and the female. And we want to make sure that all of those blood levels are where we need them to be. Great. OK, so once again, we're going to shift a little bit and talk about other issues that may be very common in the population for men, um, whether or not it's difficulty urinating, uh, maybe in, inadequate voiding of the bladder, uh, maybe there are infections, um, waking up multiple times at night. Right. Uh, can, can you talk about some of the other issues that are not prostate cancer and and right. um, and and sexual dysfunction and and then what's your role in in working with the with the patients absolutely so majority of the patients that we see in our clinics are men who have difficulty urinating okay um and typically that you'll see that those patients start to have this trouble emptying their bladder right around the age of 50 years old and I tell my patients, women have to deal with pregnancy, we have to deal with prostate problems. And what happens is right around the age of 50 years old, the prostate begins to naturally and progressively enlarge. Now, what patients have to understand is that what's important is the canal or the urethra, the tube that carries urine from the bladder out of the penis and into the toilet. And what happens with prostate enlargement is that canal, instead of it being nice and open, will start to shrink. And we'll start to notice that Patients may have to use some of their belly muscles in order to squeeze that urine out. They're starting to wake up a little more often in the bathroom, uh, wake up to go to the bathroom at night. And typically, if a patient tells me I only wake up once, but it depends on what I drink, I tell them, God bless you. You're, you're much better off than most of my patients. But some patients will wake up five to six times a night and their entire sleep sleep schedule is, is somewhat screwed up because they can't have a good night's sleep. Uh, so right around the age of 50 years old, we'll see that the prostate will begin to enlarge. Now, my role is I'm the plumber. I open up the pipes. Um, and typically what happens is we'll have the patient come into the office. I'll have them urinate into a cup and make sure that we're not dealing with an infection because bacteria in the urine can cause acute issues with urinating. Uh, the second thing we'll typically do is after they urinate for me, I'll make sure that they feel empty. And most of the time patients are like, yeah, doc, of course I'm empty. I feel great. I'll have them lay down and I'll do a bladder ultrasound, which takes about 30 seconds to do in the office. And I'll literally point out, hey, that big balloon that's full of black stuff on that ultrasound, that's all urine sitting in your bladder. So you're not empty. You may feel empty, but you're not empty. And what happens is the bladder sort of goes on vacation, okay? Because there's a lot of wear and tear on the bladder. And because it's squeezing and building all this pressure up to push the urine past this large prostate or this clog in the plumbing system, the bladder no longer becomes sensate to the urine inside of their bladder. And that's when we start dealing with infections of urine. The bladder is meant to hold urine, but it's not meant to hold urine for a long period of time. So we have to make sure our patients are emptying their bladder adequately. And what I talk about is a bladder training protocol I've developed to, to allow patients to do that, both men and women. And that involves time voiding, going to the bathroom automatically every three to four hours, regardless of the sensation to pee. I would ignore whether or not I feel like I have to be, and I would go automatically to the restroom and try to void every three to four hours. Once a patient gets to the restroom, they're standing in front of the toilet or they're sitting down. I tell them to urinate as best as possible. Before you pull your pants up and you feel empty, I want you to shake it up a little bit. That literally means pick your feet up off the ground, move a little bit for about 20 seconds and give your chant, give your bladder another shot to pee. Because what that does is essentially resets the bladder into thinking I got to go again. And when patients do that, they're able to get a little more urine out. 
The problem is the residual urine, the urine that's left over in the bladder after someone, whether it's a man or a, fe or a woman, emptying their bladder. The residual urine is what gets caught up for um, patients having to go frequently to the bathroom. They just urinate, they walk out of the bathroom, they take 10 steps and like, Damn, I, I gotta go again. And they're running back to the bathroom. Um, and that causes infections as well. So the bladder is a sensitive, it's a sensitive organ. And what happens is the inside of the bladder tissue becomes irritated and inflamed. And we want to empty that bladder as best as possible. We talk about medications. There are medications that we can um, offer patients, which what I tell them is, for instance, Tamsulosin or Flomax. It's a one tablet a day and it works like human Drano. Drano opens up the plumbing system. This medication does the same thing for our plumbing system. It helps open and alleviate the obstruction to get urine out, but it doesn't work for everybody. And at some point, the body adapts to it and the medication may just not be enough. So we talk about there are some procedures we can offer patients that one of which takes us about 10 minutes to do in our office under anesthesia. Patients walk in, they walk out of the office and they no longer have to rely on medications for the rest of their lives because they're emptying their bladder well. There are other modalities that we offer, um, but it depends on the prostate size. You have to meet certain criteria in order to uh, be a candidate for some of these procedures. Okay, so we just touched on the bladder with the with the training, but is there um, is there any connection to not emptying the bladder and 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 bladder cancer? So, sort of. Uh, patients with bladder cancer, depending on the type of bladder cancer, may present with symptoms such as frequency, urgency, and blood in the urine. That's a big one. That's a red flag, and I'm glad uh, we actually touched up on this. So patients who present with microhematuria, which means that blood in the urine that the naked eye couldn't see, but when we tested it under a microscope, we saw that there were some red blood cells. And that's sort of a telltale sign that, hey, something else needs to be done. That could mean that a patient has a kidney stone. It could mean that their prostate is enlarged. It could mean that it's bladder cancer, kidney cancer. So patients, back to your question, Denise, uh, patients who have this frequency and this urgency plus blood in the urine, we typically say, let's just make sure that the bladder looks okay. And what we do is in our office, we do about a 60 second little procedure where a camera goes inside of the bladder and the patient is awake. And that's really important for me, especially because I want my patients to be involved in their care. I don't want them to go to sleep and I say, hey, this is what I found on your bladder. And they never understand what exactly is in the bladder. And that tells us a little bit more about whether or not we're dealing with prostate cancer or an enlarged prostate or uh, an irritated and inflamed bladder. So is there, and there's, this is just one last question about this, but um, intermittent stream, in other words, yeah. if, because I, I stop know and go. people who have that, yeah, they're interrupted, it's interrupted all the time. Yeah. What is that? Is that an issue? Is that a, is that something to watch? Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, I, I have a patient who tells me his stream is sort of like the Hutch Parkway because it's constantly stop and go, stop and go. And he's got like traffic when he urinates. Um, so yes, intermittent urination is basically, did I get you there, Jason? <laughs> but intermittent urination is basically a telltale sign that the bladder is trying to build enough pressure in order to push the urine out of the bladder past the prostate. So if you got this hole that you're peeing out of and it's that small, your bladder is responsible for pushing the urine out. And that's why patients will typically say, doc, it's, he it's called hesitancy, where that urine flow is not straight uh, the flow of the stream is not strong and it's kind of got this stop and go pattern. And that's a telltale sign that there's something going on within the prostate itself. And one of the other things we talk about, how often do you have to strain and squeeze to push urine out of your bladder? And that's also a sign that the prostate is causing a clog in the plumbing system and you're squeezing in order to build pressure with your abdomen to get urine out of the bladder. So I think in closing, what I'd like to ask you is um, and, and just sort of comment on the idea that during the pandemic, many people have put off uh, going to the doctor, uh, getting a diagnosis, having the tests, raising the red flags when there's something going on. Um, and right. so I sort of want to just sort of toss that right over to you and, and can you really make the, the point about how important it is for patients in, in our community to, to get to the doctor's office and, and to be seen. 
absolutely crucial. And uh, I mean, COVID-19 was such a tremendous burden on everybody, whether it's the medical field, um, our, our, our healthcare heroes everywhere, and our patients especially. And what ended up happening was patients ended up putting a lot of the normal things off, whether it's their colonoscopy screening, whether it's their mammograms, um, whether it's uh, it's their prostate cancer screening. And unfortunately, some of those patients ended up showing up to our offices recently with new cancer diagnoses because they said, doc, I could never make it into the office or I could never make it into the hospital. So for those patients who kind of put a lot of those things off because it was such a tough time for the world in general, please get on the ball. Please make sure you see your local doctors and make sure you're following up because we all have loved ones and all of our loved ones want to make sure that we're getting the care that we need. So I absolutely encourage all of our patients not to ignore anything. All right, nothing should be ignored. Make your way into the offices and into the hospitals just to make sure that things are moving in the right direction. Thank you so much, Dr. Fakari. We really appreciate My your pleasure. time My and pleasure. your expertise and um, you know, we're going to put up uh, some contact information. Can we go to to that? Uh, so Dr. Fakari's uh, contact information is right there. Advanced Urology Centers of New York he is across the street from the Andrews Pavilion of St. John's in 944 North Broadway. Uh, number is 914-968-0000. If you uh, need a physician referral or you'd prefer to get information from the hospital, you can certainly um, do a couple of things. Uh, for those people who are still timid and who would like to talk to someone, we do, are doing virtual urgent care. We are uh, seeing people in this format, 914-964-4429. And, you know, if you do have any of the symptoms that have been discussed today, but you really have some discomfort about coming in at this point, please start here. This is absolutely a vital service to our community. And then if you have any general questions, there are numbers, the main number of the hospital, um, and you can ask for my department, which is external affairs, or you can reach us through info at riversidehealth.org, especially if you have a question that was not asked today and you would like us to get a, an answer to a question, feel free to do that. And if you do need another physician referral, please call us at 914-964-4DOC. That's 4362 or email, which is always easy, find a doc at riversidehealth.org. And so with that, I wanna thank Dr. Fakari again, and I would like to thank my team and our community partners, and I wish everyone a great day. Thank you so much to the St. John's uh, Riverside family. I wanna sincerely thank you all. Uh, to our patients out there, uh, please do not hesitate to contact one of our offices. We're happy to talk to you. Uh, talk to the St. John's Riverside Hospital physicians. Uh, uh, we, we have great relationships with them, and uh, we just want to continue uh, continue the care that uh, that everybody deserves. So I thank you all. Thank you.